Dear Lord, we have a lot to discuss when it comes to a game like Divinity Original Sin 2. There is so much to talk about, there is so much to cover, there are so many things and there's so many thoughts. Oh, how to compile them all into a video is gonna be the toughest part. But I will do my best, and hopefully afterwards you'll walk away with a better understanding of how excellent this game absolutely is. So Divinity Original Sin 2 was released not too long ago, and it is the successor, the sequel, to Divinity Original Sin 1. Stifle your collective gasps, please. Divinity, uh, I'll just call it Divinity 2 here for simplicity's sake. Divinity 2 is a game that I have discovered is about problem solving. It is a game about overcoming series of obstacles in your way, coming up with creative and inventive solutions to navigate your characters through the environment, or doing what you can to figure out how quests should be best completed, or how to maximize damage potential with the array of spells at your hands. It is a game that encourages creativity. It is a game that encourages you to roleplay. And a role-playing game, no less. Who'd have thunk that that would be a thing that is a thing? The game is complicated, yet accessible, with enough freedom that allows you to experiment and come up with your own solutions to the best way to win battles or the best way to talk to people and solve the problems the game throws at you. It's a game where often you'll fail and you'll try again with uh, different setups in order to achieve success, and that is one of its greatest strengths. Sometimes it can be a little frustrating, but I have yet to come across a problem that I couldn't solve without enough uh, proper prep work or with a little bit of uh, inventive thinking. As I said before, there's a great deal to cover when you talk about a game like Divinity Original Sin 2, so let's begin at many of the things that the game does excellently well. The game is done by Larian Studios. They are both the publisher and the developer. This is, in every sense of the word, a true indie game. It is both single player and also has drop-in, drop-out cooperative modes. It also features a battle master mode that allows you to craft things, and it's not something that I've personally looked into or I have much interest in myself, so I won't touch much on it. However, if you want more information on this mode, I encourage you to seek out other videos. It's just not really something that, you know, tickles my particular fancy. I am currently 75 hours into my current playthrough, and the end of this game is nowhere in sight. I still have a long list of quests to complete, and challenges to finish, and storylines to see the end of. I still have resolutions that need resolving and I still have battles to be fought, and I cannot imagine how many hours I will end up pouring into this game by the time I get to the end. But that's a good thing. We live in a world where single-player games can be competed in a dozen hours or less many times. Currently, the game is $45 new, not even the price of the typical AAA release at $60. So if you were ever concerned about running out of content in a game like this, don't you worry and the game is practically begging to be replayed multiple times with different setups and builds and characters themselves. Divinity Original Sin 2 is the antithesis of what it means to be lacking in content. There's so much stuff. I cannot stress this enough to you. And for those of you who already are extremely interested in looking at this game, and based on the feedback I've seen on Twitter and from people that I've spoken to, there is a great deal of interest. People just need to be pushed over the edge. People need to be convinced. They see a game like this, they see it's turn-based and it's full of exploration, but maybe that's an unfamiliar name, Divinity. I've never heard of that. It doesn't have a Skyrim before it or a Fallout before it. It's a series in a world that I don't know about. Is it really up to snuff? Is it really something that I should spend my hard-earned money on? Well, I think it absolutely is worth every penny and then some. Larian Studios has crafted a world that puts AAA games to shame. They have built a universe and they have constructed a title that is brimming with love and TLC at every corner. 
This is a game you pick up, start to play, and can almost instantly recognize that this is the sort of project that was a labor of love. This is the kind of game that you don't see every day or even every month. This is a diamond in the rough in terms of role-playing games and strategy games. As many studios take their titles and dumb them down to become more and more accessible to general audiences, eventually watering down what made those series great in the first place, Larian Studios takes a game and expands upon what made the first one so good, giving you more and more freedom and allowing you more and more options to solve obstacles in your way. This is the kind of thing that I have to applaud them for. Of course, the amount of things I have to applaud them for, that's, that's an awfully long list as you'll see. But just the attitude that goes into making a game with that kind of care and understanding of what gamers really want, it's something that should be appreciated in this day and age. We don't want to have things dumbed down and simplified for us. We want to see sequels expand on the original idea. We want to look at a game and say, wow, this sequel is, in, is, is moving forward. This is bringing the series upwards. But if you didn't play Divinity Original Sin 1, fear not, it is not at all a necessary prerequisite for playing this game. You should still go and buy Divinity Original Sin, the Enhanced Edition. It is an amazing game, absolutely. You should buy it. I have a lot of hours into that one as well. Though this one captivated me even more, and to all effects, I believe it's a better game. Jump straight forward into the number two out of the series, and fear not, you will not be losing much with what's important. So... Divinity Original Sin 2, what makes this game so amazing? For starters, this game is entirely voice acted. Well, but not entirely. There are some parts that are voice acted, but for the most part, the game is entirely voice acted. Which is an impressive feat, considering not only how many lines of dialogue are in this game, but the care and the passion that was put into the voice acting itself. We see games that are coming out of Bethesda, for instance. You'll see me referencing them quite a few times. It's almost like I'm salty or something for them, ruining series and games. Yeah. But you see games like Bethesda, where protagonist voices are often lackluster, where the candor and the bob of their... Um, oh, what's a good way to say it? They don't feel like they want to be doing the job, is what I'm trying to say. Games like this are the opposite of that. I feel like everybody who worked on the voices in this game really wanted to be doing it. Like, this is something that they enjoyed. They felt like they were putting their heart and soul and tongue and teeth into the lines that are delivered. I can tell individual chickens apart from nothing but their voices. Meanwhile, Bethesda has seven voice actors and five of them are Brandon Keener. I'm trying to fix this old water pump. Should be plenty of scrap in here. You see the care and compassion that voice actors have for this game, most obviously when you speak to animals in Divinity Original Sin. Their character really comes through in their voices, and not in a way that you can do if you don't care. The bad things under the sand are gone now, but things still smell fishy, so they do. Oh, goody, you're a good... Whatever it is you are, yes you are, who's a good thingy then? You, that's who, I want to chase you under a rock, yes, want to play rock chasey? I don't know what that means, but it sounds important. We're people, captives to be exact, enslaved by the witch. Uh, you're not here to visit Alice Elysian, are you? Off you go, I can't be seen ratanizing with the likes of you. A sorcerer? Ha! <laughs> Second rat wizards by my book. The reddish colored flesh beasts round here string your kind up by their hands. The rat hisses at you with sibilant malevolence. Carry on then, stink beast. Don't let little old me distract you from your very important stink business. Even minor characters are voice acted with a great deal of effort. Latest news! Fresh from the war owl! Hear all about it! Many a latest, my friend. The war. The bishop? The queen? What tickles your fancy? Seven savers. Stabbed in the back he was by them vile, low-born, treacherous seekers. Kill them all, I say. Do them like Magister Raymond did, old Lady Siva. That'll teach them traitors. I mean, they doomed us all, didn't they? The son of the divine is dead. Gone. Who'll save us now? 
you get the feeling that every voice actor is really role-playing the character that they're trying to represent in the game. Again, you see this the most in animals. Dogs will sound like a dog would sound. Rats will sound like rats for the most part. Cows will sound as cows might. Every character you meet, from the most important characters to the nobodies you meet in slums, will be voice acted and pull you into the world. Even from a top-down view, this is one of the most immersive kinds of games you'll play because of details like that, because care is placed on voice acting. And it's not just the voice acting, it's the actual dialogue itself. It's strange that when you look at everything from a top-down view and you can't actually see people's expressions, you can care so much about the characters that you meet. Because they went the opposite route of what Bethesda did in a game like Fallout 4. Instead of focusing on the voice acting first and the things that are actually said second, Divinity Original Sin 2 had a huge, broad, vast array of dialogue, options, and actual spoken word. Then they decided to voice act it when they had reached a point where it became feasible for them to do so. They prioritized far better, and the game is much, much better for this decision. There are so few characters I have any sort of empathy with. In a game like Fallout 4, for instance, even though you speak to them on their level, with your character right next to theirs, you could see their expressions, you could hear their speech. And yet, this is a game that I play from the top down, where characters don't change emotions, and I care far more about them. You hear it in their voice. You hear it in the narrator's explanation of things that are happening. By the way, the narrator for this game does a fantastic job as well. The tablet seems to glow from within with a subtle light. Its rooms cover it. Your fingertips burn so hot it feels like they are melting. An energy seems to travel between the tablet and your hands, sparking knowledge directly into your mind as if you're reading with your fingers. Electrical sensations sizzle in your mind. You understand that the runes are ancient Rivalonian, the oldest known language. You feel the fragments under your fingers, An An Lesru. You know not how, but you understand the meaning of these words with the very marrow of your being. One. One must rise. Then your fingers grow cold to the bone. Suddenly, you are just a person standing in a cavern, clinging to a stone tablet as if it were a life raft. The whole design of the way you explore the world is done from an old-school pen and paper Dungeons and Dragons RPG kind of style. And it's not just in the multiple ways that you can complete objectives or navigate through the environment or reach obstacles that might seem like they're uh, wardened off for you at first glance. But it's in descriptions of things. It's the way that the narrator presents information towards you. A lot of it is done using your own imagination as the player. As the narrator explains, this is what's happening and this is the sensation that your character feels. You put yourself into the world almost because it's necessary to a degree. In addition, the world itself is crafted gorgeously. Forests and rocks and boulders, plants, trees, grass, moss, stone pillars, dank dungeons. It's all animated really well. It all looks really good. It's vibrant. It's colorful. It's bright. It's inviting and grim when it needs to be as well. The camera can be rotated 360 degrees, so you can always take a look at the multiple angles, so you can see what would be the best way to maybe look at a battle as it occurs, or navigate through the environment as you take a look at different angles from above. Nothing seems lazily done. Even with the vast amount of places to go and things to see, you never get the idea that they're skimping. You never get the, uh, you never get the impression that they're trying to cut corners. Everything looks gorgeous thus far. Items are always everywhere. I mean, this is clearly something that they wanted to do well, and it comes through, and it's obvious in the way everything is portrayed. So the world building, the lore, the story behind the characters and the factions, the way you interact with everything, it's very immersive and it's very well done. Even in more civic-related matters, bartering and stealing and things of that nature, you can definitely see that a level of thought goes into the way that all these mechanics meet and interact with one another. 
If you see a chest, you can maybe try to pick it up and put it someplace else where you could get into it later or break it open in safety. Or you can sneak around as a character and try to pick people's pockets to get keys or particular items from their inventory or to break into items that they own. Maybe somebody's looking directly at a chest that you want to tank for yourself. So you can have one character talk to them and have them face the other way while your sneaky character goes behind them to enter the contents inside. Swap items places or teleport something to a faraway location, maybe even a party member. Almost every micro problem that you come across in this game has its own set of solutions. And its own set of consequences as well. But even when you're outside of combat in this game, and I'll get to combat later, it's obviously one of the big draws of this game because of how well it works. But even when you're outside of combat, there's always things that you're doing. You're always scanning the environment, looking for hidden chests and containers, or talking to people, trying to persuade them to give you information, trying to complete quests, many of which are solved without ever having to do any fighting. Sometimes optionally, sometimes not. You talk to traders, you... If you sell the things that you have, you buy the things that they've got, you use different characters that can get different prices, you can... Look, there's a lot that goes into it. There's a lot that goes into finding the items that are best for this character, making sure they have the attributes necessary to equip those items, uh, which characters should have which items. This guy's the best at bartering, so give him all the expensive stuff so he can do all the buying and selling to get you the best price. Maybe one of your characters has the highest persuasion, so maybe you should let them do the talking in your party. But when you need to take something from someone's pockets, or maybe steal something that doesn't quite belong to you, you use another character that you've been giving uh, some thievery skills to. See something locked that needs to be lockpicked? Well, you know who to go to in that case, too. No one character will be a super character. You will have people who are better at different things and who do different things better than others. But you make your characters in your party work together to create an effective, not only fighting force, but one that could solve a variety of non-combat related problems. Fighting in combat is obviously a huge part of this game. But, you'll probably spend more time out of combat. In fact, you definitely will. And acting uh, foolishly while you're outside of combat can lead to some awful consequences for your party and your characters. Even if it's something as simple as not exactly getting the best equipment that you could have, or losing out on the opportunity to expand your personal coffers. In typical RPG fashion, Divinity Original Sin 2 lets you customize a character that you will be playing as, in addition to the three or less that you'll have in your party as you go throughout the game. You can either create your own from scratch, or you, can choose from a, or you can choose from actual characters that you would otherwise uh, find in the game with established quest lines and backstories for you to explore and complete. Famed, of course, for my unique red skin and unparalleled skills as a general of the House of War, I, the Red Prince, was raised within the vast palaces of the fabled Forbidden City. I was destined to become the next emperor. But my ambitions suffered a bit of a setback when I fell from grace for cavorting with demons. And if you don't choose to play as one of these characters, you will meet them all along the way. Though your maximum party size is limited to four, unless you mod it through the workshop, and mods are supported in this game. Now, the character creation is otherwise pretty standard. You choose a class or a preset, though as you play the game, there will be huge variance between what you start out as and what you end up as. In fact, once you get to about 20 hours or so in to the second act of the game, you can respec your character in its entirety, practically. For no penalty at all, and you could do this as much as you'd like. And that's something that I took advantage of and tried to mix things around and rebuild characters and alter them wherever I felt it was necessary. This is an excellent bit of freedom that the game offers. As for the first act, you will be able to do this, again, through the use of mods that allow you to do the same thing. So you get that advantage of freedom that the PC offers. 
characters that I began as quickly became either other things or amalgamations of different classes. Having a wide variety of spells and skills at your disposal is extremely important in this game. And the spellcaster that maybe you choose to be a fire and ice based character will probably end up getting some expertise in lightning based abilities, necromancy, polymorphy, other abilities, just because it's useful to have all these different tools at your disposal to have in different situations. In my playthrough, the Red Prince began as a frontline warrior, but quickly I didn't like that kind of a character and um, eventually he morphed into another spellcaster with an emphasis on summoning fire spells and necromancy. You can edit your talents and your attributes, which do a variety of different things, especially talents. Pet Pal lets you talk to animals. Far Out Man gives you longer reach. Comeback Kid lets you bounce back from a potentially fatal blow. But you also have civil abilities in addition to the skills that let you cast fireballs and resurrect corpses. Because the vast amount of your playtime will be spent actually outside of combat. Civil abilities will allow your character to do a wide variety of actions outside of combat. Bartering lets you get higher price on sold items and lower price on purchased items, which is immensely useful. Lucky Charm increases your chances of finding extra cash or rare items whenever you search through containers. Persuasion affects your dialogue percentage uh, for success when you're talking with characters. That's immensely important. And you also have things like how, be uh, how good can you lockpick? How fast can you identify unidentified pieces of equipment so that then you could use them? Everything is useful to a degree, some more than others. But oftentimes I would make my characters with um, proficiencies in individual ones instead of just spreading everything around to every character. My main character would talk to people and he would have a bonus when he searched through items. I would have a character who was good at bartering so whenever I find valuables or money I gave it to him. Whenever I needed something identified, I had a character to identify items. When I came across a locked door or container, well, I had a lock picker just for that. Synergy between your squad here is not just effective inside of combat, but outside of it as well. Even attributes that focus on combat efficacy can help you outside of combat as well. Wits will allow you to detect items that are hidden in the world as you move around, in addition to giving you a higher percentage chance to do critical hits and increasing your initiative, which ultimately establishes the turn order in combat itself. And if you haven't noticed it so far, this is a turn-based system with the turn order displaying at the top of the screen in the middle, your party on the left, and your vast array of items and skills on the hotbar lining the bottom of the screen. Every turn in combat, a character has a certain amount of action points, or APs. These are the green and red circles down there at the bottom of the screen that you've seen flicking and filling up and going away. Every ability, spell, every movement, all the things your character does requires a certain level of action points to complete. And those are based on a variety of factors, like uh, what's your character's movement speed? Well, that will affect how far you can move per action point. Does your character have an ability that gives you more action points? Do you have a talent that gives you more action points? But you manage the total allotment of the ability for you to do things and use them in tandem with your ability, spells, items, movement to eventually, hopefully, win a fight. Enemies have action points as well and they spend them and use them and save them for later if they need to. The Lore Master ability allows you to right-click and examine enemies to see their weaknesses, their strengths, and their immunities, which is immensely useful in this game. Combat can begin in a wide variety of different ways. Sometimes you will enter combat as a result of maybe failed dialogue or because you chose to talk to somebody who just didn't like your face. Sometimes you'll be walking down a road and then you will enter combat. Sometimes you will know there's combat happening and you can be the one to choose to initiate combat and get a head start 
on damaging enemies. So if you see a bunch of uh, guys over yonder and you know you have to fight them, instead of maybe trying to converse with them through dialogue, maybe you could put your roguelike character into a sneak mode and get a free backstab, or move your archer to high ground where he will get an attack bonus, or maybe you can simply throw a fireball right off the bat at him and weaken them before the combat actually begins. Setup to combat is a very important part of this game, and normally, well, this is sort of a double-edged sword when it comes to combat. The F5 button will quick save, and you will be pressing this button a great deal. You will become intimately familiar with the feel of your F5 button because in some ways Divinity Original Sin 2 can be a little unfairly punishing. Sometimes there's just nothing you could do. You're walking down the road, you are beset upon by enemies and they're higher level than you or they're simply too tough to beat and they end up wiping your character out before you know what happens. By the hazing of the shade, I'll kill your shining lights. I'll kill your shining lights. Another world, another life. Thieves and liars I declare. Venomous toad! I'd lick his back and say goodnight! I'd skin him all alive! I'll eat your trouble! Trouble? Bubbling skin and burning knuckle! I'll kill your shining light! Oh, baby, oh, darling, I'm so sorry. You feel it too, you feel it. You've come to me. Okay. Luckily, these particular instances are very few and far between, and you can spot enemy levels before you see before you fight them. If if you if you manage to see them first, but even in that scenario, sometimes fights just can't be won, and you have to try again. This time, setting up your characters in different positions, maybe grouping them together, or spreading them out, or putting them into higher spots or lower spots or preparing for the fight by attacking first. And ultimately, that's not an issue that should dissuade you too much from playing the game. I think it's sort of the nature of Divinity Original Sin. You come across obstacles that you can't just barge into, walk into, and so as a result, you try to prepare. You try to problem solve with how the combat works. And it does take a little bit of time to understand how armor regenerates out of combat, and how characters react to your characters, and how their attitudes can influence your interactions, but you get it down pretty soon, and then will find yourself going through things without too much of an issue. But the game is fairly challenging as it is on its normal difficulty, and that's where I'd recommend you start. It's not easy, it's not immensely difficult, but it is a, a pleasantly um, acceptable challenge throughout, even at the lower ends and the higher ends. Difficulty in fights is largely determined by levels. You level up, and the enemies have levels too, and so you try to go in places where the enemy levels are either close to yours as possible, or beneath yours. The first time I came across this Scarecrow fight that you've been seeing here, they were a couple levels ahead of me. And having an enemy just be two levels above you is a huge deal. Tackling enemies one level above you is no small feat either. The game clearly uses this to kind of direct you towards certain directions. Though ultimately I don't feel like this was necessary to do. A lot of your damage and skills are based off of, almost primarily, your level. Why not scale enemies to always be at your level so that we don't have to go to the places that necessarily Larian Studios wanted us to go to first? It's very obvious that the Scarecrow fight here was to kind of act as a warden between players first entering this Act 2 area and more northern places above it. Why not just scale them to my level and all of the other enemies to my level, and if an enemy is supposed to be particularly more difficult, 
have them be a level above me, or maybe I even have a boss be two levels above me. Why not use a system like that? Ultimately, though, this is really more of a nitpick, because there's so many things to do, and there's so many places to go, and so much stuff to explore, you don't find yourself feeling like you're restricted from the map. Instead, maybe you just hit a place and you say, ah, instead of going right on this fork in the road, I'll go left instead. And then sure enough, by the time you get back to that fork in the road, you're more than prepared for the challenges that once stood in your way. But as I said before, sometimes there are just fights that, look, I can't imagine someone going through this game cold on their first try and not just getting stomped in a couple places because things happen that they could not have foreseen. Perhaps you will come across a mutant wolf monster in the forest, and you say, oh, this is fairly easy enough, kill the mutant, it's, it's four on one, what is, okay, fine, we can do this. Then you start combat, he summons four other wolves, and they buff him up in the buff stack, and the, you couldn't see that coming. There's just no way for you to have seen that coming. And then you load your last save, and you set your characters upright, and you know that he will do something, and to a degree that kind of... That kind of breaks the immersion in some way, that you have this precognizant knowledge of things to come that your characters in the game could not have possibly known. But I think it's part of the, I'm not going to say charm necessarily, but I, I think it's part of the design of this game. There is a level of trial and error when it comes to fighting. Now, inside the fights... You eventually learn that, you know, spells do this, abilities do that, there are these kinds of resistances, and it's best to take advantage of them in these ways. But, let's put it this way, let's take a game like Skyrim, for instance, where you play as a hero, you play as a dragonborn, and someone warns you that there is an evil beast in a cave, and this evil beast has never been vanquished. The bravest warriors in all of the land have not been able to kill this monster. Well... In almost every game, what does that mean? It means you obviously go towards the cave and you find out uh, just what this evil monster is and you go out with the intention to slay it because you're the hero of the video game. The game is designed around you as a protagonist. Video games teach us to not heed the warnings of NPCs and the warnings of the environment. You see a cave full of spider webs and skulls and you think, all right, there are spiders inside. It's an adventure for me and I could take them out and it won't be an issue because I'm the hero of the story. Divinity Original Sin doesn't quite work like that. You need to heed the warnings of, uh, of characters in this game, but not always, but sometimes you do. So you might hear about a particular monster that guards a bridge. You might hear about a beast that stalks a certain part of the land. You might hear of a particular character in a mansion in a graveyard. You can hear all these stories about enemies that you're supposed to be fighting, and it's really, really difficult for you to decide whether or not you should heed the warnings or not because of the way that leveling works. And is this supposed to be a quest that I take now, or should it be something that I do later? Sometimes it can just be very difficult. Now, all of this can, of course, be solved with the liberal application of your finger to the F5 button over and over. And ultimately, it doesn't create a huge hindrance to enjoying the game, but it's something that I've noticed kind of pops up every once in a while. Unless you can directly examine enemies and check their levels before fights, it's very difficult to get a grasp of what is truly going to be a, a fight you can't win against characters and what isn't. I'm, I'm making it sound like more of an issue than it is, but I feel like I, I need to try and be critical of this game because of how many excellent things it does extremely well. But, getting back to the combat itself, you and your party will ultimately enter a combat state. Not necessarily all at the same time. You can have one of your characters unlink from everyone else and go do their own thing. Perhaps start a fight while everyone else in your party prepares or moves into a better position. Or, normally what happens is everybody enters the fight at the same time. Turn order is determined by your character's initiative, which can be affected by your wit statistic as well as items that give you bonuses. And equipment in this game, like in many classic RPGs and 
well, really a lot of games these days, is immensely powerful. It is very important that you have good equipment with you whenever you can get it, which makes having a large amount of money extremely important because you can often buy the best things from certain vendors, as well as uh, skill books that will allow you to, you know, use more skills. The skills come in a wide variety of different kinds and forms. You have Pyrokinetic, for instance, which is fire-based spells. They can light people on fire, warm them up, um, which sets, sets them up for being on fire. They can leave fiery, um, fiery fire fire on the ground, which does magical armor damage, more on that later, and can set fire to characters. You have, let me see, Geomancer skills, which can slow enemies or poison them or knock them down. You have uh, Huntsman abilities, which are about uh, using a bow, an arrow, or a crossbow to hit enemies. Maybe an arrow that ricochets or pierces through enemy armor, or that allows you to jump up in the air to get height advantage on enemies when you otherwise might not have. You have Hydrosophist abilities. They can chill and freeze and shoot ice at enemies, as well as restoring magical armor with uh, certain buffs and auras, as well as rejuvenating your vitality with healing spells. Interestingly, in this game, the undead characters are healed by poison, but casting a healing spell on them will damage them, something that's always worth keeping in mind, especially because you can play as an undead character and pick up undead characters as party members. Some abilities and spells are a little bit more unorthodox. Aerothurge abilities can do lightning damage, which can shock and stun enemies. And they can also do strange things, like perhaps teleport an enemy or a friend to a certain faraway location, uh, an ability that is immensely useful outside of combat as well. Uh, most of these abilities can be used outside of combat, again, and sometimes that can play uh, that can play a very important part in how you interact with the world and the characters inside of it. Maybe you could use the Aerothurge ability Nether Swap, which can swap the location of a character or a friend or even a corpse with one another to great effect, either height advantage or just putting distance between you and enemy characters. There's Polymorph, which allows you to assume maybe animal body parts like a bull's horn or a falcon's wing to uh, charge enemies or to glide over otherwise harmful surfaces, respectively. Summoning will allow you to create creatures from the ether to fight on your side, which you can buff as you need to. Necromancy allows you to rejuvenate your own vitality by damaging enemy vitality. It allows you to raise corpses as allies, and it allows you to siphon, perhaps, uh, armor or uh, health from enemies. There are, of course, more, but I think you understand the gist of it. And there's no restriction on how you pair those things with every character. So, Let's say, and this bugs me by the way, how a lot of games encourage you to be extremely good at one particular thing and they make mixing and matching abilities kind of eh, but battle mages are extremely useful in this. I have a party of three spellcasters and an archer and two of those spellcasters have a shield because shields are useful, okay? They keep the death away. Shields um, give you more armor, and I'll talk about armor in just a moment, but this game does a really good job at encouraging you to mix and match skills. So, let's say you have, um, you want to make a battle mage, right, and he's like your frontline warrior. So, what you do is you give him a mix of constitution and strength and intelligence, and he can have warfare abilities, which are about getting close and personal with the enemies, and you also maybe give them necromancy so that he can keep his vitality up as he damages enemies and and use his spells against enemies when they're close up and then you give him maybe some personal buffs through a hydra's office to keep his armor high or maybe geomancer skills to keep his armor high it, it really really encourages you to mix and match abilities i ended up giving for instance um uh, ifan who was a uh, my archer, I ended up giving him Scoundrel and Geomancer abilities so that if he needed to, he could use more magical stuff at range instead of doing physical damage. So, damage is categorized into two different types, pretty much. Physical and magical. 
At the bottom of the screen, you can see the red vitality bar, but also you can see the gray bar and the blue bar above them on the left and right sides, respectively. That is a difference between this game and the last Divinity Original Sin. You have physical armor, which resists physical damage, but also physical statuses. Also, you have magical armor, which resists magical-based attacks and keeps away magical statuses. I played the first Divinity Original Sin for quite a while, and one thing that was sort of the double-edged sword of that game was how important stun locking was whenever you were in combat. You shocked someone, and then you shocked them again to stun them. Or, you got them warm with one ability, and then you got them warm again with another ability to set them on fire. You chilled them with an ice ability, and then hit them with another ice ability to freeze them or you uh, maybe made them stumble and knock them down. You tried to do whatever you could to set the enemy into some sort of an incapacitated state where they would have to spend their turn recovering and could not move. And this could be done regardless of what your health was at. And the enemies knew very well how to do this too. I remember some particular fights from Divinity Original Sin 1 where I was immensely frustrated because enemies would just stun lock your characters, which is one of the most awful things to happen because it's a game about you doing things and when you can't do things and you just watch the enemy take their turns and beat the shit out of your characters, it makes you upset. This game has changed that system with the physical and magical armor that they give to characters. Physical and magical armor is uh, based off of mostly the equipment that you have. Strength-based equipment that warriors, for instance, or high-strength characters would have gives you more physical armor. But spell casting, hoods and robes, that sort of thing that uh, a magician might use, these give you magical armor. With some exceptions, um... Statuses are resisted by this armor, so you can't just walk up to somebody and then use a skill to knock them down and incapacitate them. You have to take out their physical armor, which makes them susceptible to that physical status. You can't just light an enemy on fire, you have to go through their magical armor, and then, once that's gone, then you could shock them, then you could stun them, then you could freeze them. I think this is a really good change because, again, it works both ways. It protects enemy characters and it also protects you. But, what this also does is it kind of encourages you to focus, for the most part, on having mostly magical or mostly physical damage. Because, if you whittle away someone's magical armor and then go up and hit them with an axe to the face, that will just not do any vitality damage. That won't take away their health, that will just take away their physical armor. But then at the same time, enemies have a variety of different mixes and matches of types of armor. So, some enemies will have no physical armor and all magical armor, and vice versa. And some enemies will have way more magical armor than physical armor, so you get what I'm getting at. Variety is good, but you know, that's, just, that's just the nature of the beast. But it's never been an unsurmountable obstacle so far, and again, I'm almost 80 hours into this game. And it hasn't been too much of an issue for me. That's why I know, hey, that enemy has a lot of magical armor and not too much physical armor. So my archer, who is almost a physical armor specialist, he will focus on that enemy and try to stun lock him or try to whittle him down. And my spellcasters will focus on enemies maybe who are um, less resilient to magical attacks. But again, all of this is very situational and you'll learn what the best move is for the best times. Um... Similar, I, I don't know if you've been watching it, this is from an earlier part in the game. Um, if you put Glass Cannon, uh, I, glass, glass Cannon, by the way, was way better in the first one. That's a talent that means you start with maximum action points, but armor doesn't protect you from statuses. Instead of what it used to do, which was you start with more action points, but you have half vitality. You're literally half as vulnerable to dying, but you can do more things in combat. I think that was a way better system than what they have here. It's too easy to get stun locked. And oddly enough, what that means is that if you want a tank character, you give the tank character glass cannon so that the enemy somehow knows that you have glass cannon and can focus all of their crowd control and status abilities on that character and your others can, you know, try to get away from the effects of that and you can heal them and buff your tank as necessary. Also, I found out that it's hard to actually have a tank in this game because even if you get a fully armor-clad warrior right next to the enemy lines, they will just target 
someone else in the back that does all the damage, which makes sense when you're fighting against human players, but when the game actually starts and you're fighting against computer-controlled characters, it gets awfully frustrating. That's why the game started out with the Red Prince of mine being a frontline, you know, warrior, and then he quickly shifted to a spellcaster like everyone else in the party because there's no point in having a, a, a tank in this game. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm just building it wrong, that's probably the case, that's just something I noticed from my first playthrough. But the game does encourage multiple playthroughs. It's hard for me to go, oh, with everything I know, I could go back to the beginning and I could, you know, do even better. But ultimately, Divinity Original Sin's combat is extremely intuitive. The way that you form the battlefield, and the way that you set statuses, and the way that you have elements interacting with each other is immensely satisfying, and it can work to your benefit. So, let's say there's oil on the ground, if you set it afire, then it explodes, does fire damage, and it sets fire on the ground that does magical damage or health damage to anyone walking over it. If you have a puddle of poison, you could set that on fire as well. If you have clouds on the battlefield that can be formed from a variety of different combinations, you can make them poison clouds or shocky clouds. Or maybe you could see a puddle of water, you could shock the puddle of water, hit it with fire to make a steam cloud, you could cast ice on the ground to give people the chance to slip and be knocked down by it. You could carry around barrels of water to put on the ground in a battlefield if you need it, and then hit those to shock them. The combinations you could do are pretty wide and varied, and the terrain that you fight with in battles is extremely varied as well, with high and low spots, and with open areas and choke points, and everything in between. And the environments, as I said before, are varied not only in their composition, but in their look. And this lends itself very well to the combat, a lot of which is based off of your positioning. When you add in the fact that spells and abilities become more useful as time goes on, as your knowledge of how they interact with everything else increases, so too are you extremely glad that you can respec your character at pretty much any time for no cost at all. There's no penalty to you seeing an enemy do something in battle and then saying, you know what, that would be nifty if I could do it. Or, what if instead of having a focus on this kind of abilities, maybe I change to having this kind of abilities. Or, you come to the realization that maybe I'm too focused in one area, so all my fire spell proficiency, it's not going to mean much if I come across enemies who are immune to fire or even healed by it. The game's combat definitely encourages you to have a wide ability of spells and elemental-based abilities at one time. Oh, and you can see the enemy just there shocking uh, puddles of blood on the floor. Combat is ultimately challenging, but very satisfying, and it remains fun. I'm, over, I'm around 80 hours in the game, and I still have fun playing this game. I like trying new things, I like combining different elements in battle to see what their effects will be, I like trying to find the best, most efficient way to dispatch my foes. Another element of Divinity Original Sin that's very important is leveling up your character, and in this game it's extremely important, and sometimes I would go maybe out of my way to attack enemies that I felt deserved it, necessarily, in order to get the sweet, sweet XP that you get for defeating enemies. In a lot of other games, you just kind of go, eh, yeah, he's a douche, but yeah, whatever, he gets to live, or man, I really wish I could kill this enemy, but it's, I don't really get anything from it. This game, because it is challenging, and because experience and the acquisition of that experience is so important in the game, a lot of the times I've found myself doing... Uh, maybe vigilante-style attacks on people I thought deserved it. Maybe you come across an enemy who double-crossed you, and you don't necessarily have to fight them at all, but you decide to because fuck that guy, he double-crossed you and put you in danger, and maybe he would do it to somebody else, but he certainly did it to you, and you know what? You're gonna kill him for that, and you're gonna take his shit, and you're gonna take that experience. The desire and the need to get as much experience as possible often led me to doing things that were kind of questionable that I definitely wouldn't have done in other games. 
So if you have a video game, like an RPG, where you level up and get better equipment, if that game is really, really easy, and your need for equipment and experience is much less than it would be in a game like this, you have much more of a propensity, I believe, to maybe show mercy on people who you otherwise probably should have killed or dispatched or... I Look, what I'm, I'm trying to say is that there is, it's not a desperate situation in this game, but there's definitely always in the back of your head the knowledge that you have to get better as a character, you have to get better equipment, and you have to level up. And even in the story, there are very direct, not at all subtle, messages from characters to you who are important that say, don't worry about petty morality, you need to become more powerful for maybe the greater good, for instance. I just noticed as I was playing this game that as other games get really, really easy, you become much more merciful and lenient with how you deal with people. And in this game, you want to try and take advantage of people as most you can so that you can become as strong as you can because challenges actually arise. And, oh my gosh, 15 minutes of me prattling on about Divinity Original Sin. You know, I'm gonna be honest, this is probably gonna be my game of the year. This is the kind of RPG that I really like. Not just the dummy, run forward, hack and slash, throw a fireball that you see in Skyrim and other games. And at the same time, it's not so analytical and in-depth that you have to read Encyclopedia Britannica's in order to understand. It's a game that encourages you to learn about the systems inside of it. It is surprisingly accessible, and it's a game that I think is very aware that you should play in order to, um, that you should play in order to learn. It has a few punishing moments here and there, but it's about quick saving, it's about being prepared, and it's about ultimately understanding that you can overcome pretty much any obstacle by proper preparation or maybe just trying a different avenue of approach. And that's what I like about this game. It encourages exploration and it encourages experimentation. Exploration outside of combat and experimentation, well, everywhere you go. The amount of freedom that this game offers to uh, overcome the challenges in and out of combat, I really enjoy. It's good to finally find a role-playing game where I can feel like I role-play a character or I feel really sucked into the world and I can enjoy it. A world that's dangerous, fraught with peril, where there's a lot of morally gray situations that I might have to be the mediator of. Where there's characters that I give a damn about even though I can't even see their facial expressions and all I can get from their text is, well, what they say and how they say it. I'm overjoyed that this true indie game has such a big following and has sold so many copies, especially in a world where Bethesda's next dumbed-down, watered-down RPG sells 10 billion copies to everybody. This game clearly has a target market. People who want to play an RPG, that's actually an RPG. That's not stupid, that's not dumb, that takes a little bit of thought and preparation and experimentation. A game that wants you to find your fun in the systems that they create. So if you are interested in RPGs and strategy games, this is exactly what you might be looking for. So go out, buy it, buy two copies, you'll love it. Oh, and the game has co-op.